So, now the case. Let me go through the case, like we, at least how the Ebola, how the whole mystery unfolded. I'm going to be talking about from the time we, we suspect that we, we are having something dangerous to the time when the government intervened. So I'm only going to be talking about that. Uh, but uh, even after government intervention, in case maybe you have any question, I can maybe do that. But um, I concentrated on this period between that because we thought it was the most critical in management of this epidemic. Now we had NF, uh, who was a female who was 25 years, and uh, she was from Kakute village. Kakute village is about eight kilometers away from our facility. And uh, she presented on the 2nd of November 2012 with high-grade fever, which had been on for less than seven days, and general body weakness, which had been also on for less than seven days, and cough and chest pain, which had been on for three days. Now, the way this patient presented, this is the typical way our cases present, in, uh, like with malaria, because we live in a malaria endemic zone. So most of them come with high-grade fevers, general body weakness, maybe vomiting, some at times even come with, with GI upsets. So she presents with nothing which was pointing at Ebola at this point. So she reported having high, uh, the history is that she, she, she reported that she had high grade fevers which were intermittent and she denied have, ever having any convulsions or vomiting but she reported that uh, she had general body weakness associated. So she also reported that she had cough which was productive with uh, associated chest pain but she denied having hemoptysis, all night sweats, evening fevers, all loss of weight or any other B symptom. So she reported normal bowel habits and normal medication habits and she had not taken any previous medication. So when she comes and she comes with uh, this typical presentation, we took the vitals and there was nothing like significant. Like I said, in our setting, uh, we don't have, we, we, our resources, we, we don't have a lot of things actually. Like for example, most of the times actually we, we, uh, we say febrile, to touch, we, we normally, though the, the to touch bit is in most cases silent, but she, she was febrile and she was not pale, she was not jaundiced, there was no dehydration. And the pulse was 88 beats per minute and the blood pressure was uh, normal, 115 over 65. So there was nothing much. So per abdomen, there was nothing much actually and the chest by that time, despite the chest symptoms. So our impression, our working impression at that point on the second was complicated malaria. So the plan was to do a blood slide for malaria parasites and to do an HIV test, which we did because actually, uh, by that time, that's all that we could do. So this is the laboratory actually uh, where all this actually happens. Captain Edrissa, uh, by that time, okay, she visited our facility some time back, I think two years ago, and uh, she visited our lab, actually, she, was, she couldn't believe what she was seeing. So, <laughs> so when, we did, uh, when we did laboratory investigation, actually, she had a hyperparasitemia. So it confirmed our diagnosis that this patient had uh, complicated malaria. The HIV test was negative, so we instituted IV quinine treatment, and... Uh, we also gave an antipyretic and we were to monitor the patient closely. Now, now on the 3rd of November, this patient started improving. So we, we, we planned that we were to discharge her on the 4th because most of the times actually if a patient is admitted, we give them three doses of IV quinine. Then after giving them the three doses of IV quinine, then we give them oral quinine treatment. And if they tolerate the quinine orally, then we allow them on the, the other remaining oral quinine dose at home and then they come back for review in the outpatient department like in two weeks time to see. So, so this patient was improving on treatment and our plan was to discharge her. So on the 4th of November, when we were planning to discharge NF, uh, her sister was admitted in our same facility with the same symptoms. So when, uh, so the sister comes to the facility, actually she finds me actually there. And uh, so, as I was talking to NF, the sister tells me, then she tells me, by the way, doctor, even my sister is admitted and is also having what? Of course, I started, I started asking, do you use a mosquito net? Do you use this? But at the end of the day, so, but I, 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 I got a little inquisitive and I was like, two sisters to be admitted with complicated malaria in the same family at the same point in time? Something might be wrong somewhere. So, this is when I, I probed further. And on probing further, 
Then they told me that they had a brother who had done two week, who had died two weeks earlier, and uh, that's when we suspect that this might have been the index case. But the problem is that she died and was buried, and we, and we did not do any investigation. So, that, but we just suspected because these two are the ones who took care of their brother, and the brother also, the one I talked about, went to a clinic and then went to a military hospital. So, so, so these two come and they present actually with the same symptoms that their brother had. So at the end of the day, this is when we suspect that their brother must have been the index case for us. And then we started suspecting that at this particular point, that whatever we were dealing with, much as the lab was showing us that it was malaria and there were some signs of uh, improvement, but we started suspecting that whatever we were dealing with must have been very highly infectious. And uh, at this point, actually, our working diagnosis was Mabag. So meanwhile, NF deteriorated. And so when she deteriorated, uh, uh, like I said, uh, now this time we went in a desperate mode. So we added the track zone. Uh, it's a broad spectrum, uh, third generation cephalosporin. And uh, we gave two grams once a day. And, and then we had to keep her on that until, until maybe, she like maybe she was to improve. So she deteriorated, we added this. And at this point, we realized that we are dealing with a highly infectious disease. So we developed a, a, a case definition. So at this point, what we, what we did was that every patient who came in in our facility with chest symptoms, very high grade fevers, general body weaknesses, we had to take them seriously and we had to isolate them. So that was our initial case definition. And we had to take precautions. And the precautions that we took, the precautionary measures that we took was, number one, we had to minimize contact as much as possible uh, between uh, the health workers and all the patients who are coming in. So at the end of the day, in minimizing contact, we, first we isolated the ones we suspected to be having a highly infectious disease. And uh, then two, we agreed that you only touch them when you really had to touch them. Don't just, actually even taking the vitals and other things, we had to put it on hold. Actually, by that time, we said that you were to touch the patient only if you are taking a sample or if you are giving treatment. And that is IV treatment. For, but for oral treatment, we could give, the, of course the patient could take the medications themselves. So, and then we also put JIC uh, in place. That everyone who was going to see the patient, you could step in JIC, then you attend to the patient. Then after that, you do what? Then after that, you step, still step in JIC and then you put yeah, the gumboot somewhere. So, so, the, so, so we also put that in, in place. And then the other thing is, by the time we had resource constraints, because we didn't have a lot of supplies. So what we did is that uh, we got gloves. And when we got gloves, is that like all health workers who had to touch any patient, they were supposed to be in, in the protective gear, at least. But though the gloves were these, these simple disposable gloves. And so, and we, and we also talked to the patients and gave them some health education talk. And we told them that however much these, these are your relatives and you love them so much, don't touch them with bare hands. And after touching them, wash your hands. So we gave them a, a box of disposable gloves, and we also we could also use gloves. So at the end of the day, we are minimizing contact, but we also ensure that even their relatives were minimizing contact. Now, minimizing contact in an African setting is not as easy as it might be in the, in the, in the Western world. Because at the end of the day, we have a lot of attachments to our families. Actually, uh, one thing which are, uh, uh, we are proud of uh, way back that side is that a family is one of the most important aspects of the community. And uh, everyone will, will fight actually uh, 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 till death for, like for their family. So that's one of the pluses that we have that side. So, and because of that, putting on gloves to touch your wife, to touch your mother, to touch your sister, to touch your brother, it is looked at as uh, like you are, you are treating your brother or sister like an outcast. So at the end of the day, it is, it is not something which is, which is uh, easily digestible for an African person. But at least we communicated to them those messages. And we told them that, please, however much you love these people, however much you care about these people so much, please, 
you also have a, a role to play. Minimize contact as we also minimize contact on our side. So the minimizing contact, the hand washing, all these things, the precautionary measures, were not only for the health workers, but also for the other people who are taking care of our clients. And we think, okay, it, actually, we think this is the gist of the matter. And we think that it is what helped us to contain this epidemic from spreading actually very fast. So at the end of the day, we isolated uh, those two patients and uh, actually we had to close off the facility and we refused actually any more admissions, save for people who could come in with sim similar symptoms. And then we put those two patients uh, in, uh, uh, like in the admission side. We took, the, we, we, we took this measure because we thought that if we admit other cases, uh, uh, transfer of infection from one patient to another might be might be easier in our setting. So what we did, we, we liaised with the facilities which were around us and we told them that uh, to, to, to accommodate our patients. So for us, we, we concentrated on these ones. So we put hand washing facilities in place and, uh, and uh, we informed actually our authorities, our, our bosses. Now, we, now it so happens that um, by this time when we are having this epidemic, we are having another epidemic which was running uh, in, in Chibari, the one actually where 17 people succumbed out of the 24 who were confirmed. So it was uh, actually, they were almost containing, the minister was almost actually declaring that we are Ebola free. Then we come up with this. So actually I remember well, that day when I got this, I, 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 we, we, at the district we have a district director for health services. So I called the director for health services and I tell him that uh, uh, I, I, I think I'm dealing with something which is highly infectious. So he asked me what I'm dealing with. I told him that I'm suspecting that we might be having my bag. Then he told me, please take all the precautions that you can. But at the moment, we are doing badly because we didn't have resources. That was the, that was the truth. And our drugs as a, uh, as, a, uh, as a country to the health system, they flow in cycles, drugs and supplies. So, and uh, they, they are two monthly cycles, meaning that in the whole year, you get, you get drug supplies from the, from the government, from the government six times. And like, for example, the, the, the facility which I serve, our total drug budget for the whole year is around 45 million Uganda shillings. Uh, I think which is something like, uh, I don't know how many dollars, it was, uh, I think it's like 15,000, 15,000, 12,000, 15,000 US dollars, which is too, too small. <laughs> Actually, I understand there are some people who don't run their families on that budget, they are, who need much bigger budgets for their families in Uganda. But that is the budget for the drugs. So at the end of the day, at this point in time, uh, we were just expecting another supply, meaning that the, the other supplies which we had received earlier in the previous cycle were depleted. So we went to the district stores. Okay, the district store, I, he gave us, the, the DHO helped us and gave us a few pairs of gloves and some few protective gears, but there's nothing much. And then we, we, we had to inform the, the ministry. And uh, the ministry also by this time, because we were, they were having other epidemics running in the country. Still, they could do nothing much. Because at, at, at that patch, actually, actually, I remember when I talked to one of the ministry officials, they told me that, uh, please manage it that, like the way you've been dealing with what? Like I've been dealing with other diseases. Maybe it is something else. Because we think Mabaga has been what? Has been contained. And that, 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 is, the, that is the reply that I got. So we waited for support because wanted protective gear, wanted to take off samples. Actually, at this point, actually, we even wanted to take off samples and, uh, and, and take them because we have a Uganda Virus Research Institute where we take samples for highly infectious diseases and for screening. But we couldn't because at the end of the day, uh, I think, I don't know, but I think uh, because we were young health workers, <laughs> so, and the young health workers, uh, coming up with some of these uh, weird diagnoses, I think uh, the senior people did not take us very serious because we were, we were young in a small facility. Uh, they didn't take us very serious. So we so waited for some of the, the support and we didn't get. So four days later, after waiting, because after calling the ministry, calling the district to come and help us, and we were not getting much. So four days later, what we did was we got off the samples ourselves. And we have vaccine carriers 
uh, which we use to go to, to do vaccinations in the communities. So we took off the samples ourselves, we put it in a vaccine carrier, and uh, we gave it to one of the health workers who sat in a taxi with a <laughs> with Ebola sample, a, a, <laughs> a matatu, and then went to the city center where there is the Central Public Health Laboratory. And she reached there at 8 p.m. on the fourth day when we had suspected and we waited and waited and nothing was coming. And so when she reached here, she also just put it there. And uh, with the, of course with a note that we are suspecting Ebola. So then, so meanwhile, both our patients deteriorated and they passed away. Actually, NF, we gave ceftriaxone, but the most in, uh, interesting thing is that every time we could give treatment, she could be like improving, but then she could then deteriorate much further than actually that she was. So we put fluids, but still even the fluids, uh, we, we didn't have much. And uh, at the end of the day, she, she did what? At the end of the day, the, uh, the, even the fluids are not, were not very easy to come by because we, we had to write for them to go and buy. So what they could afford and they could give us is what we could give them. So they both passed away. And uh, maybe the other important note is that the Ebola like, the typical Ebola like symptoms, which are, which are written in most of our medical books, they manifested towards the end, okay, terminally as they were dying. Because, like, for example, NF, when she was, uh, like, like, I think on the fourth, uh, the fourth day of, um, of admission, she developed epistaxis. And when she develops epistaxis, so what we did with that, we did nasal packing with adrenaline. So we did, and uh, somehow, actually, somehow she deteriorated. So, so she, 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 she first deteriorated, then uh, the, 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 the nurse in charge of the department, Martha does what? Fixes the, 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 the nasal packs. She got nas goes and then impregnated it with adrenaline, then she packed the noses. So, so when she packed, there was some improvement. So now when I come back, she tells me, that I've packed this patient with, she's having a pig success, and I've packed, but the bleeding stops uh, for just uh, temporarily, then it, it blows again. So I also tried to pack myself, and we packed. And uh, so we packed, but then later we realized that then she developed uh, dysentery. And then when she developed dysentery, she got respiratory distress, and then she passed away. Then two days later, even the sister also went through the same cycle and then she also did what? She also passed away. So we took the sample to UVRI, actually. I think, let me see, it was around 5th, 5th, 6th November. Then when we took it there, then it reached, I think, the ministry. It reached the UVRI on the 13th, <laughs> which is like 10 days later. And then when, and then, I understand a sample, one sample was sent to CDC Atlanta, then another one was taken to UVRI before I think they could do, they could come up to tell us that we had an Ebola outbreak. And both samples turned out to be positive for Ebola. And this is when the ministry now comes running to come and help. <laughs> so another, the, the interesting bit was that uh, when they declared that we, we had Ebola, I fell sick. But I didn't get, <laughs> but it was not Ebola. But I, get, sim I got symptoms which were exactly like the patients I had been managing. <laughs> so I went back home and uh, of course I took precautionary measures. I have, I have a wife whom I love and uh, kids, the, the ones I told you, they're four, now they are four years. So I did uh, social distancing and uh, I, I, I went to my bedroom and I refused them to touch me or to come anywhere close to me. Of course, for children, they, they might not understand. But at the end of the day, that's what I enforced. And I took amoxil with fluids, and somehow I improved. So possibly, uh, most, I think it was not Ebola, but it, just, it was coincidental. Then important notes. Now, when all this was happening, and then we did what? We, we confirmed that we had an epidemic. Then, like, of the 50-something stuff that I have, majority ran away. And when they ran away, very few remained. And actually, I remember this point in time, remember I, I, I fell sick around that time. So I was at home, and uh, then they declare that you are having a bullet at your facility, and all the health workers have run away. So they ran away, and all my friends, all my relatives, all, all those people who care, they could call and they say, we have heard that the facility you are heading, there is Ebola. Please don't go back. 
please don't go back. But then while I was there, then I realized that all health workers had run away and I had to go back. And uh, so I went back and uh, because there were a few, we are less than eight people who, who remained at the facility during that epidemic because most of the people ran away from fire. So we didn't have supplies. We didn't have drugs because of the budget line that I've talked about. And uh, we didn't have running water at the facility because we are dependent on uh, a borehole at our facility. Uh, now, now, the borehole, that, uh, it means that like, um, transmission of infections is very, like actually if, if you had an, an infection like Ebola, it, is, it can be very easy because if an Ebola patient came and pumped water and also came and also pumped uh, water from, it means that you, you can easily get the whatever, the, the virus from there. So we didn't have running water at the facility and uh, the space was minimal because we had to seal off the facility to at least to, to do what, to optimize the, the, the space that we had and want to leave it for patients who are suspecting that they had the epidemic. And, it didn't, and we don't have proper waste disposal facilities because what we do is that in our setting, we, you just, you just d dig a pit. Then after digging a pit, uh, when you have any waste, you just bring it like, and then you pour some little petrol, then you light it, then the cake which it forms, is what you, then you throw it into the pit. That's how we dispose our waste. <laughs> so, the, so, so even West Dispose actually for these infectious uh, agents actually, it is very, very, it's key, but we didn't have that. Because at the end of the day, uh, uh, at least segregation and uh, waste handling is very important. And then we also, our facilities don't have fences. And actually where I come from, there is no fence at all. So this one is also important in a way because patient, you cannot restrict movement. Even if you tell patients that uh, uh, we have uh, higher infectious cases, yeah, please don't go. There's no way you're going to enforce it because at the end of the day, the patients can access the facility anywhere they feel like entering through. So we, we don't have uh, designated, like this is the main gate and you identify yourself and you do this. So you cannot regulate movement in our setting. And then the other thing is that uh, we had uh, poor ambulance facilities. Because ambulance facilities, we have pickup trucks. And uh, our pickup trucks, actually, like for example, the ambulance which I have at my facility, its mileage, I think, is 270 something. So it has been running for the last very many years, actually. I don't know whether, let me show you my ambulance. You know, if you look at it from the looks, it looks deceptive, but it is this one. It's a pickup truck. Uh, actually, but we put it like on a hill. Not because, not because that is where there is parking, but because of the gravitational force. Because if you're going to start it, you need, <laughs> you need gravity to aid. It's, <laughs> it's fun. <laughs> yes. So, so, and then the other thing is that uh, myths and misconceptions. Now, it so happened that around this time when we had uh, these two patients coming to our facility, and uh, their brother, who, who, who died earlier, uh, who is suspected to be the index case, had had a, a land wrangle with someone. Now, land, actually, for us in our settings, there are people fight because of land and, and wives, eh? w women. Those are the things we, African men fight for, <laughs> women and, man, and land. So it so happened that this, this, the index case, the one we suspected, had been involved in a, a land wrangle with a neighbor. And after involving in a land wrangle with a neighbor, then he develops this illness. So what happened is that the, the community took it that the neighbor bewitched him to take the piece of land. So when even the sisters fell sick, a big portion of the community was, was with the thinking that uh, that uh, the other person who wanted to take their land, who wanted to clear the whole family such that he does what? He takes their land peacefully without any disturbance and, and what? So, and this was very hard to, to do it, to get off people's minds actually at the end of the day. And, uh, and, and uh, when we are doing actually our health education, because at the end of the day when, we, when it was confirmed, we had to intensify health education to all places, schools, mosques, uh, uh, marketplaces, churches, we went to all those places to do that. But the biggest problem was, was that because everyone 
could tell you that that man, uh, that how can Ebola come after quarreling with someone over land? So for them, they, uh, they, 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 you, could not, you could not convince them. So, but later we, we got a breakthrough, but after some, actually, it was the biggest problem that we had. Then the other thing is, is uh, with all due respect, the Muslim community. Because what happened is that the Muslim community, uh, there is a way they conduct their burials, which is, uh, which is not like the conventional, like where these other religions do it. Because the other religions... Like if, but they wash bodies, and then I think that at least the, the contact they have with the body is much more than the other religions. At least I've come across. So, so it so happened that uh, around this time we had to come up with measures to to see that we curb the epidemic. And one of them actually was that uh, around that time, if someone was to die, uh, there was no washing of bodies, and uh, across the whole district. And, and, uh, and more so, actually, if you, you died and you had any of the symptoms which were suspicious, actually, you, it, 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 it was supposed to be the burial team which was instituted at our facility, which was supposed to come and conduct the burial. You were not supposed to touch the patient. You could leave the patient to us, and then for us, we could come, and then we'd conduct the burial. So, but at the end of the day, the Muslim community actually was also very hostile because they also say that from their beliefs, it is not acceptable. Actually, at one point, uh, there is someone who died. One of the suspects died, and uh, and uh, we, we agreed with them that uh, we wanted to to conduct the burial because of the burial team because of the possible health implications. So at the end of the day, they accepted us. So we, our burial team went with the body. So reaching there, uh, reaching the cemetery where we were supposed to hide, we found the, the whole community had mobilized with a heap of stones and sticks. And then they told us that if you want your lives, put our body here and go away. And we had to do it. We had to give them their body and they did what? The good thing is that the good news was that we were taken off the samples and by the time the samples came back, they were Ebola negative. But just imagine if they were Ebola positive, it would have caused calamity. But so those are the, 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 the major misconceptions that we had, witchcraft and then the religious uh, that, that, that line of thinking. So the major gaps which we had in this Ebola outbreak in our setting is that we were incapacitated to do very many diagnostic tests. Actually, the best that we could do was HIV testing. And the HIV testing, I think it's because of the help we are getting from CDC, because CDC is helping. We have a number of organizations in our setting, Maldme, Baylor. So they give them funds. So they buy for us, actually, as many testing kits as possible, actually they even ex, uh, expire. So, I think, so now those ones we have in plenty. And then maybe the malaria, because we also have a malaria consortium, which is I think supported by a global fund. And so they give us microscopes and, and, and uh, at least the microscopes, the, uh, the field stains A and B, uh, uh, they are very cheap and they can, they, can, they can work on very many patients. So that's, that, that's all at that particular point. That we, can, that we could do. So we could not do a complete blood count or full blood count. Now one may wonder why I, would, I might be interested in a full blood count. Now the full blood count, like for me, a health worker who is in a, in a low facility uh, there, at least if I get a full blood count, it can give me a blood picture. And then maybe I can reduce on the guessing and then maybe I know the line. Because if I find maybe there's a neutrophilia, I will start reasoning differently. If I find there's a lymphocyte, whatever, I'll, I'll, I'll reason differently. If I find this, I reason differently. So, uh, so at the end of the day, we, we don't have that luxury in our settings. Then chest investigations like chest x-ray and the others. We, 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 because like I said, all these patients came in with chest symptoms. They could come complaining of chest symptoms and uh, uh, dyspnea. Then at the end of the day, we, but we were not, we, we, we don't, we, actually, no one has actually uh, an x-ray to show how the, the, their lung fields were. We are reliant on only the, the, what you could hear with a stethoscope. And uh, because much as they had uh, chest symptoms, like, on, 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 uh, like listening to the chest uh, auscultation, the, the, uh, like you couldn't get anything serious. So... So they're uh, pretty complex. So then the other gap we had is that the, the, the government was slow to respond. Uh, actually, in our setting, our government systems are more reactive 
they are not proactive. Because what happens is that uh, the day, because I remember when uh, uh, from Atlanta CDC, it was, a, a, I remember it was the 14th of November at midnight. Actually, it was 11.45 when I got a phone call that the samples which people sent from that unit are Ebola positive. The following day at 7.30 I was at the unit. I found the whole unit, it was like a parking lot. The ministry, district, what, everyone now had come to swing into action. So actually, I was like, I wish you had come much earlier. <laughs> I wish you had come. But at this point, everyone comes with all, everything that you need. And at the end of the day, now the fluids you bring them, when actually all the cases we have had have died, you get. So, that doesn't make a lot of sense, though it is good, but not that. Not, not that. So that the reactive response, really, uh, it is one of the gaps we have in the developing countries. Like people first wait for things to blow out of proportion. That, that, that's when they remember to act very fast. Then orientation on Ebola. I appreciate the USAMRID team, which is working uh, way back in East Africa, because the, of, the, of the work they are doing to... to to orient people in the, on the especially dangerous pathogens, uh, the Ebola, and anthrax, and all those other diseases, and uh, and uh, it so happens that uh, what has been hap what has been happening, despite the fact that we have been having very many epidemics in East Africa, disorientation actually we we, we, are, we don't have. Okay, what has been happening is that if at your facility you get an epidemic, then they will come and they orient your health workers. So if if the, the next time. The, it, uh, it strikes, uh, calamity strikes at another facility. Then that means that either they have to train those ones or they have to ferry these ones who are trained. Now the trouble which comes with that is if you take these ones from this facility, it means this one, the facility will close. As you're trying to curb the other epidemic, you'll be causing another health hazard here. So, and that has been the problem. But at least I thank the, the Captain Mikes and, uh, and the colleagues, and uh, the, the, the Major Matthew and... Uh, and the Elenas who are helping us at least in orienting health workers in uh, at least that is a plus because by that time actually by the time we had this outbreak from in my facility <laughs> I was the head of the team but <laughs> no one was oriented actually even me I was just reading Ebola in books actually at times I even wonder how I came to think that it might have been Ebola but I, I think it was just adding the history and all the things and I just suspected but and, uh, and I have a feeling that there are some epidemics and some other diseases which go through our systems in the developed, in the low developed countries uh, without us noticing them because no one actually follows them. So orientation in Ebola we didn't have actually. And uh, at the end of the day, uh, I think God, God just helped. Then the resources were not readily available. Then the surveillance systems, the surveillance systems actually are very poor. Because like for example, surveillance, uh, like for example for especially dangerous pathogens in our setting is a role of Ministry of Health. So like for example, like now like when we had all this, we, we did protective gear from the Ministry and by that time they were having another epidemic elsewhere. So they were, they were handling and they had taken all their energies to that area. And at the district we, we, we didn't have anything and at the, at the units, we didn't have anything. So at the end of the day, this, this, these systems actually, I think there are some of the things which we need to improve upon. But at least uh, every, every experience is a learning experience. And so we, 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 we have also learned a lot from, from our mistakes. So this is the waste disposal that I talked about. When you have any waste, you carry it, uh, there is a yellow, this one is for shops, this, this, this box is for shops, like for example. So we segregate our waste, uh, highly infectious, non-infectious, and, and the rest, then the shops. So we, then we bring them like to, to a place like this one. It, this is a pit. So we burn them from the top. We, so we pour them here. And then after pouring them, then we put like petrol or, or kerosene. So we burn, then after burning, then the cake which forms is, is the one which we, we did with what? We throw in the pit. Now the, 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 the most important bit about this is that the people who handle the waste are not health workers. And uh, they, are, they are cleaners actually who, 
who actually they, they, they just have they, they don't even have any basic training any medical knowledge or anything so at the end of the day for them they might not appreciate why you have put this one in a yellow box why is this one here so which is one of the challenges that we have in our setting because the people who are under the west and do all this this work uh, they are they are not they are not oriented on that then so this is the borehole the source of the water for the facility at that point uh, which i was talking about because all of us the the health workers they get water from here because th this one is a staff quarter there's also there also houses behind that plantation where health workers stay so i don't know all of them fetch water from here and uh, the, the the hospital the the health facility itself water from there the patients themselves the, the water from there so at the end of the day uh it is uh it is good because there are some there are some facilities which don't have anything for us at least we have a borehole but it can also be a public a public health concern because in cases of uh, a dangerous pathogen you can end up transmitting to the community with that so maybe some of the statistics as i conclude the index case was the motorcycle rider whom i've already talked about we had cases with laboratory confirmations where six and three of the confirmed cases died so but the case fertility was like so the total cases was seven because we added the other index case and then the total suspects we, whom we had actually we and uh, we, uh, we put in our facility were 16 and then the last confirmed case was admitted on the 17th of november 2012 and then the last discharge was on the 5th of december 2012 and then we were declared ebola free on the 16th so learning points from this outbreak there are no supermen in management of epidemics you need to manage as a team because everyone has a role to play. The, 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 a cleaner has a role to play. A nurse has a role to play. A doctor has a role to play. A guard has a role to play. The community has a role to play. The religious leaders have a role to play. So you cannot, you, you cannot be a superman and then you say, I contain this. You, we, we are supposed, the only thing is that the team is supposed to have a leader. Because uh, like, if, if, if you are, if you have a team and the team has no leader, of course, that, that, that means that nothing can be done. Then we also learned that simple procedures are very important in, in infection control. Yes, we have those complicated PPEs, we have what, but at the end of the day, if we adhere to these simple, simple procedures, wash your hands, minimize contact. Because washing my hands, I don't need government to give me water because I can get water. I can even harvest water from the rains. I can get water from the borehole. And then at the end of the day, it will do much if I, if, if I, if I wash my hands. Then minimizing contact. I don't think minimizing contact still I also need government to come and give me anything to minimize contact with the patient. So minimizing contact and isolating patients, patient education, these simple things which are not very, which don't require resources. Actually, they are the, they are the foundation of, uh, of infection control. Then record keeping that I've already explained, it is also very, very important because this is the only way we are going to be picking the complicated cases and then also or the suspects because if you do not take your records and you don't take a nice history and uh, you're working in uganda that means you're just going to end up treating yourself that's what my lecturers tell me that if you don't get the right diagnosis for you may think you're treating the patient when you are treating yourself so so record keeping is uh, very important because actually most of the times in our setting we rely on the history to make the diagnosis because our laboratories cannot give us much. So, and then the other thing is that no staff members or no health workers were infected or died during this outbreak, which is unusual because most of the time actually Ebola outbreaks actually, very many health workers succumb to them, but we didn't have any health worker who died in this setting. But I think it's because I think we, we picked it very very early and then maybe and we took precautions early then actually this is what i remember when I, I talked to the laboratory person who took the first blood sample from nf um, on second so i asked her the, uh, how she she took the sample and she told me she took the sample without 
putting on gloves. That she just got the finger, like, then pricked it, then, then got blood. So, <laughs> but the gloves actually were on the table, like, on her, she had, because before she works in the lab, and the gloves were there. So I asked her, why didn't you use the gloves? And she was like, I also don't know. <laughs> so some of these things, it's more of health worker attitude. So, so we are happy that at least no one got or succumbed to the epidemic. And then maintaining order and managing patients during the wait for the Minister of Health. Actually, those 10 days when we were waiting for Minister to intervene and then the other stakeholders to come in, I think it was also another bit because I think that was the most critical period because if that period we, we had not done play, played our part I think maybe things would have been it would have been a different story by now and then sensitization of the community like I said there are the myths the misconceptions in our African settings are much more than like reasons because people are not exposed and they don't read because the reading culture is very deficient actually in our setting there so at the end of the day we had very many misconceptions and that so sensitization was very very important in helping our patients and then maybe maybe the, uh, the other one is political will actually i remember when we had that epidemic the parliament uh, uh, was told actually that we needed funds to to curb the epidemic and the parliament was not very was negative uh so like ministry is just planning to to waste money what what the politicians at times they reason in different ways i don't know what their intentions okay it was after the west africa the <laughs> the, the outbreak in west africa that that's when the parliament of uganda in one of the sittings they came and say we thank our health workers because we think they are doing a good work they they realize after seeing that health workers elsewhere they are not picked things very fast. So that, that, those are some of the challenges that we have in our setting. So this is a hand washing facility, which we, we, uh, uh, this is like a 20 liter. So we put soap here and then we put a basin. So, uh, and we put them like here, like if you're going to, to the toilet, then the uh, then outpatient departments, and then uh, on the wards. But the biggest problem we have is that uh, we don't have a, a lot of security in our setting because you can come and you put them there and then the following day you find when they have been taken away you know <laughs> you know that, that's our setting but at the end of the day th those are the things so thank you so much thank you so much